All right. Good evening, everyone. It's seven o'clock. Um, I just wanted to make sure I try to get through what we got tonight. I have a question at the end. I want to make sure I, I think I'll have definitely have time to address tonight. Um, and I want to make sure that I do that as well. But we'll complete, Lord willing, Psalm 119. So if we would, let's uh, open up with prayer and uh, we will proceed from there. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this day. We bless your name. We are grateful to you for this opportunity to come before you. And we thank you for Bible study. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for just the simplicity of your word. We thank you, God, for just the richness of your holy word and just the power of your word. Lord, may we tonight study to show ourselves approved unto you, workmen and women that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We pray, God, that tonight, that out of your holy word, that you will give us revelation that can only come from you, that will not only help our situation, God, but help us to just be better for you. Strengthen our relationship tonight, Lord, through this Bible study. Strengthen our witness in you. And Heavenly Father, it is our prayer that you are glorified tonight and that your people are edified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen. Just a couple of quick uh, things. You know, we'll be back in person on uh, Resurrection Sunday, the 31st. And so I just pray that everybody will, that can be will be with us uh, in person uh, on that day, but certainly we'll be virtual uh, as well. And so we're grateful for that. And Lord willing, we'll be back at Bible study on next Thursday night uh, as well, uh, just with uh, whether it be some questions, whether we address some things, or you know, uh, with Holy Week will be next week as well. And so there'll be plenty that we'll have to draw from uh, in regards to that. Uh, but also, uh, as we go forward, I think it's probably going to come after Resurrection Sunday. I'm going to go back to some things on one of the biggest challenges to, uh, you know, Christianity as we witness, which is what, what is known in theological circles, philosophical circles as well, as the problem of evil and how do we deal with a good and loving God and evil in the world. Uh, I said this last week on Bible study. It amazes me that human beings act as if we are just been sinless. And that evil exists in the world apart from us, aside from us, that we've never contributed, we've never sinned, we've never done anything. But we act like God is wrong because he just doesn't stop all evil. But I'll deal with that then. I'm not going to get into that now. So tonight, what I want to do is finish up Psalm 119. And then I had a question. I want you to hang around with me uh, on uh, transgenderism and how do we deal with that as Christians and people in our families and family events and gatherings and stuff like that with a lot of that going on. And, you know, what is our, you know, position? How, to, how should we, you know, handle that as Christians? And I'm going to deal with that tonight, um, you know, accurately and adequately from the word of God, I, you know, so um, you all know, I've never shied away from that. I've been doing that for years. I was watching something today and somebody was talking about, uh, and I thought it was good because uh, a pastor was dealing with, and, and the person that was hosting this piece said, if your pastor hadn't dealt with this, in the last four or five years, you might want to look for another church. I said, well, my folks, some of my folks might be tired of me addressing it. So uh, it is what it is, but it's the truth from the word of the Lord. Uh, and so I'm a, we'll, we're certainly going to address that tonight. But all right. So uh, for those who may be tuning in for the first time, uh, I've been dealing with Psalm 119 for about three, four weeks now. So all the intros and all the information, additional information is found on those. Uh, if you go back and listen on YouTube, uh, they're there. And so you can get some background. I'm just going to pick up where we left off last time, which was uh, which would be our next one will be Psalm 119 verses 29 through 136. This particular stanza uh, of the longest chapter in the Bible is referred to your is referenced as God's word is wonderful. The light shines in the darkness. And so we, one of the things we want to look at certainly in Psalm 129 and 136. And like I said, our goal tonight is to complete this. Uh, but again, if you have questions or comments or anything like that, or uh, questions in regards to this or anything else, you can certainly ask them, but I want to try to, you know, do my best to answer the question that was sent in to me or asked of me. Um, Psalm 119, 129, 1 through 36 say very simply this, thy testimonies are wonderful. Meaning again, we looked at the various uh, different terminologies used for the word of God. Testimonies was one of them. Thy testimonies or thy word is one, you know, are wonderful. Therefore, doth my doth my soul keep them. And see, that's the thing I think where people have to understand is, you know, it's one thing to have a head knowledge. It's another thing to have what I call a heart. And and when I make reference to the biblical text as heart, it's not talking about the physical organ that's beating. Although it is a great 
work of creation of God that is similar because so much of it uh, aligns one with another. And that's how we can appreciate the creation of God. But we're talking about that which our soul are, you know, are, are really uh, very much our mind, will, and emotions. But more importantly is really the thing that will last all eternity for all eternity. It's the thing about my life, my heart that I gave over to him. So that testimonies are wonderful. Therefore doth my soul or my heart, or however you want to put it, keep them. That's why the psalmist said earlier, that word I've hidden in my heart, basically meaning in my soul, that I may not sin against you. That's where I keep the word of the Lord, because that's the thing that will hold me. That's where the reins are uh, for my life, really. That's one of the reasons why, why uh, uh, in Proverbs, it tells you to keep your heart or, or to guard your heart with all diligence. And the reason why is because that's that's the essence of that, not meaning the physical beating heart, but that which is the soul. Verse 130, the entrance of thy words giveth life. It giveth understanding unto the simple. And I'm going to tell you something. Uh, you know, just the, the, the word of the Lord, it really does illuminate. It gives light to situations. It gives light about people. That's what I always say. Never underestimate the revelation of God. Because the revelation of God will show you things you cannot see in people, in situations, in life in general, and the revelation of God. And that's one of the reasons why I often pray before Bible study for the revelation of God, because it will shine a light. In, in scriptures we've read before, hundreds of times, it will shine a new light to, to illuminate something else. His word, the entrance of that word gives light. So when you allow the word to enter into your life, if you allow the word to enter into your soul, your heart, it will give light to you. It giveth understanding unto the simple. I'm a living witness on this. Because there are things I just didn't understand until I allowed the word to enter into my heart and to my life and allowed it to give light to those things. And it gives also understanding. Verse 131, I opened my mouth and, and panted for I longed for thy commandments. See, when you when you are after, when you desire his commandments, you know, I always say this, you know, there's not an example where you can show me where God's people were hungry for him and his word that he didn't feed them abundantly. Listen, you got to look at this even in the physical. When the multitudes came and were hungry, Jesus fed them with, 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 with fish and bread and had leftovers. How much more will those who are his people long and hunger for his word that he not feed them abundantly? Psalm 130, uh, uh, verse 132 and Psalm 119. Look thou upon me and be merciful unto me as thou usest to do unto those that love thy name. You know, th there is there is so much in this that is from the psalmist to God. There's so much in this that really illuminates the fact of God toward us. That this is a beautiful piece, a uh, song that really is written. It's almost a it's almost a call and response at times in this. Um, and again, it just speaks to the fact, look thou upon me and be merciful unto me as thou usest to do unto those that love thy name. Order my steps in thy word and let not any iniquity have dominion over me. This is, see, this is part of the issues. I'm going to answer the question about transgender and all this other stuff tonight later on. This is the real issue that's going on now is. The world, does, or, or the world, especially this, you know, this country whom I love, don't love me the same way I love it, but it is what it is, right? We are saying, and even the church, we aren't saying, order my steps in thy word. And because here's the thing, no, what we're telling God is, God, bless the steps that I have, <laughs> whether it's in that word or not. No, God, you take orders on my steps and I'll step and then I just want you to bless. No, no, no. The psalmist understood this. Order my steps, not in my word, but in thy word. That means then what you call sin is sin. What you call righteousness is righteousness. What you call holy is holy. What you call unholy is unholy. Order my steps in thy word. But here's the thing. There's a key to this. And let not any iniquity have dominion over me. Now, I position myself for that when I allow God to order my steps in his word. But there is an acknowledgement by the psalmist that there is still iniquity that is there and don't let it have dominion over me, right? 
I might be struggling. They don't have the meaning. Don't let, don't let this sin, this iniquity, this thing that is outside of your word or outside of steps that you would order or ordain to win over me, to have dominion over me to the point that now I don't want you to order my steps in your word. I don't want to walk in the ways of righteousness. I don't want you to lead me along the path of righteousness for your name's sake because it has dominion. And if we look around in this world, we look around in some churches. What has happened is iniquity has dominion. When, you're, when, when the primary goal of the church is to have a good following on social media rather than to lift up the name of Jesus, steps ain't being ordered. When the goal is to make sure that we please the people, right? That our brand name is, that, stop, no, order my steps in thy word. Right, okay. Verse 134. And then you wonder why iniquity has dominion. Deliver me from the oppression of man, so I will, so will I keep thy precepts. See, here's the thing. Part of the issue is, and I'm not saying that, that there's not oppression that comes. Part of the oppression sometimes is self-oppression in the sense of, I just need for them to like me. I just need to be accepted. I just need to not be canceled. <laughs> right. That means you being oppressed. Oh, At, you know, I've always said this. One of the greatest deliverance that you can ever receive from God is the need or desire from people's approval. Not drugs, not alcohol, not sex, not anything. I'm not saying that deliverance from those things are not powerful. But if you can get the deliverance from the need or even desire from the approval of humankind, you got yourself something. Now, I'm telling you, you free then. Okay, let me keep going. Verse 135, make thy face to shine upon thy servants and teach me thy statutes. Lord, just let your face shine upon me. Because I know that if, if that's the case, it's evident that, I, that I'm your servant. There's blessings upon that. There's pleasure with from you upon that. But then continue to teach me thy statutes. Teach me your word. Let me see wonderful things in thy law, as the psalmist would say in other places. Right. Teach Because again, I don't know everything. And I also don't know what I need to know for what's coming. 136, rivers of water run down my eyes because they because they kept not thy law. It, it ought to grieve us as Christians that the world, that the church, that people won't keep his commands. It ought to grieve us. And I'm telling you, you it, it, there's not a day that goes by probably. If you watch news, get news feeds, or you just encounter humanity. That you see something else and you're just like, man, I, I really didn't think it could get worse than this. That ought to grieve us. All right. The next stanza is Psalm 137 through 144. God's word is righteous, everlasting righteousness. And that's the thing. What's right with God and what's right before God, what, what God would stand beside and say is right. Righteous art thou, O Lord, and upright are thy judgments. And when I'm I'm gonna say this now, but I'm gonna deal with this much later, like I said after uh, Resurrection Sunday when I deal with the Bible sitting on that. You know, God is not operating on a earthly timetable. God is operating on an eternal timetable. So a lot of times people don't think God's judgments are right because they're not right right now in your eyes. <laughs> who, who and let me point out, and I'm talking about me too, all of us are unrighteous, right? <laughs> He, we were made, those of us who have any righteousness about us is because, because God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become, as in a process, the righteousness of God in him. But let's be very, very clear in that. God's judgments are right, but God's judgments is not based upon finite earth. Okay. 138, thy testimonies that thou hast commanded are righteous and very faithful. See, I love this because, again, the interchange of the word, word. So that testimony, that word that was, that is, and will always be, that thou hast commanded, are righteous 
God's word is righteous. His commandments are righteous. Period. And very faithful. And this is where it. This is one of the one of the passages I would use to say, always that wherever look the principles of God work. His word works. No matter the generation, no matter the time frame throughout history. God's word is faithful. I can count on this now. I can count on it in the future. And guess what? They counted on it in the past. It was right then. It's right now. It'll always be right. It was trustworthy and faithful then. It is now and it will always be. My zeal hath consumed me because mine enemies have forgotten thy word. Thy word is very pure. Therefore, thy servant love. You know, God's word, it, 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 there's purity and then there's, because I love the way the psalmist says, thy word is very, you know, it, 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 if the psalmist had just said thy word is pure, that means it's, it's without flaw. It's without error. It's perfect. But that word is very pure. Thy servant love. I love it because it is that. It don't discriminate. Right? It's right and true for all eternity. It is just that. Verse 141, I am small and despise, yet do I not forget thy precept. You know, listen, uh, when you preach truth, when you preach righteousness, when you preach about what is, you know, repentance and things like that, in this world, you know, oftentimes you're not going to be big, as they say, which really don't matter to me. I just matters what what we are in God's eyes, right? Uh, but people will despise you. People will want to cancel you. But I love this. This this Psalm 141, this is long before cancel culture came around. I am small and despised. Yet do not I forget thy precepts, thy word. Worry about that. What I understand is, but the word is still right. You might despise me. You don't have to like me. Word still right. I might be small. You might you might make make light of the fact that I'm doesn't matter. Word still right, and I won't forget that. Psalm one forty two, um, Psalm one eighteen, verse forty one forty two. Thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and thy law is the truth, not a truth, the truth. First of all, God's righteousness is an everlasting righteousness. What was right with God when he said, let there be and before that, because Jesus was a lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. So even before God said, let there be what was right then is an everlasting righteousness is right now. And thy law is the truth. It endures. The truth endures. You don't have to like it, but at some point you're going to accept it because it's going to still be around. She said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Bible goes on to tell me that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. At some point, at some point, at some point, you will have to accept the truth. He never said you had to like it. We as Christians need to live by it. We need to trust it. We need to operate in it. We need to speak the truth. We need to speak it in love, right? All right, verse uh, 143, that trouble and anguish have taken hold on me, yet thy commandments are my delights. <laughs> I still find delight, even in times of trouble, in his word. The righteousness of thy testimonies is everlasting. Give me understanding and I shall live. You don't, we don't really live until we come into right relationship with Jesus Christ and really get into his word because he will give us understanding and that right and and begin to live right we just existing outside of it the next stanza represents god's word is true uh some even refer to it as hope deferred psalm 145 psalm 119 145 through 152 say very simply this i cried with my whole heart hear me O lord i will keep thy statutes i cried unto thee save me and i shall keep thy testimony See, again, I, I think the key in here is whole heart, not half-hearted, not fair weather. I cried with my whole heart, whether I had successes or failures, not just because I was going through, not because I was in a, in, a, in a season of peace, 
I cry with my whole heart. Hear me, O oh Lord. I will keep thy statutes. No matter what situation I'm in, I'm going to give him my whole heart and I'm going to keep the statutes. I cried unto thee, save me, and I shall keep thy testimonies. I prevented the dawning of the morning and cried. I hoped in thy word. You know, we put our, God is the God of hope. The scripture uh, uh, that, that we've talked about here recently and has come up recently. I think Elder Thompson brought that up or Deacon Ed brought it up in uh, in-person service. But I just want us to understand something. When we put our hope in God's word, what we're saying is, God, I put my hope in you because you're the God of hope. Right. So, again, God gives us, you know, really hope is something that allows us to keep on living. I'm just telling you. My eyes prevent the night watches that I might meditate in the hour. Listen, you know, we ought to stay. That's why blessed is the one who who, who, uh, who walks down the counsel of the ungodly, stand in the way of sinners, of sin, and sees the scornful. But their delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law does they meditate day and night. My eyes prevent the night watch. My, my eyes prevent the night watches that I might meditate in our word. Oh, look, you know, whether I'm sleeping, whether I'm resting, whether I'm up, if I can't sleep, I'm still in his word. Hear my, what it now? Hear my voice according unto thy loving kind. The word says, with thy loving kindness, with loving kindness have I drawn. Hear my voice according unto thy loving kindness. God said, I extended you loving kindness so that I could draw you in. Now the psalmist understands in that relationship. That's that's how, that's the way he operates. Hear my voice according unto thy loving kindness, O Lord. Quicken me, make me alive, according to thy judgment. Psalm 1, verse 150. They draw nigh that follow after mischief. They are far from thy law. They come for me that are after mischief, but they far from thy law. Thou art near, O Lord, and all thy commandments are true. But see, here's the thing. Even though those who are after mischief may come after me, here's what I know because I'm after his word, is that he's near me. And all thy commandments are true. I'm just going to stick to this commandment. Doesn't matter what comes from me. I know who's with me. That's what we need to understand. That's really what the psalmist is saying in 150 and 151. I know some stuff, some mischief might come for me. But I also know in verse 51 who is near and who is with me. All right. Concerning thy testimonies, I have known of old that thou hast founded them forever. Lord, your word, I've known that you that your word has been found is forever. That word forever, Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Let's keep going to the next stanza, 153 to 160. It says, very, Lord, uh, the love for God's word, precious life. Consider mine affliction and deliver me, for I do not forget thy law. You know, this is really almost a prayer here. I, I know it's. It's still the verses, it's still the stanzas, it's still all of those kind of things, but it's almost that consider my affliction and deliver. Lord, just look upon my affliction, look upon what I'm going through, what I'm dealing with, and deliver me. That's the petition right there. For I do not forget that law. And, and you know, it's it's okay. when you See, when you're in relationship with God, there's a difference in dialogue. This is why a lot of times church people, or people outside, they don't understand that they, you know, this seems almost irreverent. This seems almost, you know, sacrilegious, almost blasphemous, but actually, no, actually it's, I'm in relationship. So, so we got, we have a diff, we have a different way of communicating and communing. Consider my affliction. Lord, I know, you know, but just consider my affliction. I know I don't deserve it, but, but still, would you consider it and deliver me? I'm making a petition. And then I'm saying, for I do not forget that law. What it's also saying is because I know in your law, there's mercy. I know in your law, there is grace. I know in your law, there is loving kindness. I know in your law, it's part of your character and your nature. That those who keep your law mean something to you. <laughs> 154, plead my cause and deliver me. Quicken me according unto thy word. Again, 
it's it's just making this not only a plea, this petition, it's it's a longing for a desire to be made alive again, according to your word. But this is saying, and even in just verse 154, is God, I know you to be a restorer. I know you one that can revive. Right? And we as we as modern day Christians can say, I know you be one that resurrects. Mm -hmm. Right? 155, salvation is far from the wicked, but they seek not thy statutes. Here is a truth. And when you say this to people, they act like you're unloving. They act like you're unchristian. They act like you're ungodly. But this is really just quoting the word. Salvation is far from the wicked, for they seek not thy statute. They don't seek your word. They don't seek Jesus Christ. They don't seek what you have said. They don't seek your holy word found in the 66 books known as the Holy Bible. So salvation is far from them. That's a truth. I'm not supposed to not tell you the truth. Right? I need to stop. Listen, if these home going services, stop. If, if somebody out there, you know, wilding out, gang banging, didn't want nothing to do with the Lord, stop talking about, you know, they rest him in the bosom of Abraham. You need to leave that to the Lord. Just say, I pray the Lord is merciful, right? Talk about what you know and, and how they live. Just, just leave that alone. If you ain't got nothing nice to say, get that three minutes to somebody else. <laughs> Salvation is far from the wicked. That's what Randall said, what the word said. Well, they seek not that statutes. Great are thy tender mercies, O Lord. Quicken me according to that just see. I love this because because great is far is far more than less. <laughs> great are thy ten. See, there's a difference between just mercy, but tender mercies have a purpose behind it. Greater thy tender mercy, O Lord, quicken me according to thy judgments. Many are my persecutors and mine enemies, yet I do not decline from thy testimonies. Now listen, we can't be happy about great when it comes to tender mercies and not be realistic about many when it comes to persecutors and enemies. Listen, if, if we living for God, we share, we, we showing and sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ, we're going to have persecutors. That is things that come from evil. That is whom Satan will use to keep us or hinder us in our walk and relationship with God to accomplish the purpose that God has for us. But then we just got some straight up enemies. They just against us. But even in the midst of that, even if it may be many, I do not decline from that testimony. I'm not going to turn from his word. Right? Okay. I beheld the transgressors and was grieved because they kept not thy word. Right? When folks are in the transgressors, because they're not keeping his word. I beheld the transgressors and was grieved. I wasn't just, you know, I... Listen, I wasn't just con I wasn't condemning them. What I was saying was I'm grieved. This is sad because I know salvation is far from the wicked. I know that they're not keeping God's word. That doesn't end well. It's not going to be well with them. That grieve, that ought to grieve us when we look at the world in which we see. Consider how I love thy precepts. Quicken me, O Lord, according to thy loving kindness. Thy word is true from the beginning. And every one of thy righteous judgments endure forever. Realistically, I could probably end right here, but I know I got 16 more verses. <laughs> thy word is true from the beginning, and every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. So really what it's saying is his word is true from the beginning and throughout all eternity. <laughs> his judgments are, his word is, his testimonies are. All right? The next stanza, 161 through 168, Rejoicing in God's word, the place of peace. Hallelujah. Now, listen, I, I thought this was interesting as I was kind of reading through this and preparing this uh, again. But this was one, uh, 161 was, was an interesting verse, uh, just in the sense of, it says, princes have persecuted me without a cause, but my heart standeth in awe of that word. Now, listen, it is easy to get caught up when you're being, you know, it's one thing to be persecuted. And you say, okay, well, I, I can understand why this is happening. I may not agree with it or whatever. But to be persecuted without a cause really can mess you up. 
But the, it says, and, and then to have it done from people who are in authority and have um, power is another thing because that adds a level of concern as to what they might wield against you in the present age. Princes have persecuted me without a cause. But my heart standeth in awe of thy word. I'm still blown away, God, by your word. I'm still taken aback by your word. It's accuracy, how adequate it is in times, how much is needed. God, just how wonderful it is, how it speaks to me, how it gives me life. I'm still in awe, even though I'm being persecuted by those in power and authority without a cause. I re verse 162, I rejoice at thy word as one that find a great sport. <laughs> See, now I ain't going to spend a whole lot of time on 162, but I'm going to just let this sit for a minute. I know in this world in which we live here, a lot of folk want to be billionaires. You know, when I was growing up a kid, you know, being a millionaire, I guess, was a big thing. That's that's not the thing. No more. Everybody won't be billionaires. So if you found a legit, you know, billions or whatever it may be, right, how would you rejoice? The psalmist says, well, let me put this into perspective. I rejoice at that word as one that findeth great sport. Really, you could almost say this. I rejoice at your word as one that findeth billions, trillions, zillions. See, I know. You know why people would rejoice at that? Because what they would think is that it solves my problems. And where they're missing at in the great spoil is the great spoil. Because even by even the Bible says in Proverbs, it says that money answers, or Ecclesiastes, money answers everything. It says money answers. It don't say money solves. See, I rejoice at that word. If y'all let me preach this just for a second, I promise you this will bless you. I rejoice at his word because his word solves as one that finds great spoil. Granted to the secular, to the worldly, to the non-spiritual, great spoil might answer and they might rejoice that they got an answer. But I rejoice at his word because I got a solution. Oh, my goodness. Oh, see, money can fly in the best search, get you in the best hospital. Oh, get you, um, have the best equipment, the best drugs, but it ain't solved your condition. Money might get you to the best rehab, but that word can deliver. Preach, Randall. Uh, let me stop. Okay. I'm, I'm just saying, great spoil might put you in a position to receive the best that the world has to offer, but his word gives you the best that heaven has to offer. It solves your problem. Listen, I'm, I'm going to get up and run right here in a minute, but let me, Psalm 163. I hate and abhor, let me keep going. I got to I gotta answer this question. I hate and abhor lying, but thy law do I love. You know why? Because his law is truth and his law isn't lying. So if I hate and abhor lying, then I can't love his law. But if I love his law, then I ought to hate and abhor lying. 164, seven times a day do I praise thee because of thy righteous judgment. God, I just praise you just because you are God. Just through all throughout the day. Great peace have they which love thy law. Nothing shall offend me. You know why I ain't offended? Because I know what God's word says about it. Great peace have they which love thy law. I'm not moved by situations because I know God. God's word gives me peace about it. That's why that hope comes in that. I get peace because there's hope from the God of hope in his law. Lord, I have hope for thy salvation and done and done thy commandments. My soul hated, my soul hath kept thy testimonies and I love them exceedingly. I have kept thy precepts and thy testimonies for all my ways are before thee. I hope for thy salvation and done thy commandments. Because I do hope for salvation. That's why Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Right? We know he's returning. My soul hath kept thy testimonies and I love them exceedingly. Love your word exceedingly. I've kept thy precepts and thy testimonies for all my ways are before you. Lord, I know they're before you. And I want you to be pleased 
with me. That's why I keep them. All right. The last stands, deliverance by God's word. Teach me, help me, seek me. <laughs> Let my cry come near before thee, O Lord. Give me understanding according to thy word. Oh, this is beautiful to me. Let my cry come near before thee. Let my petition, let my angst, my anxiety, let me, my burdens, cast thy burdens upon the Lord, he shall sustain me, right? Cast thy cares upon him, for he cares for you. Let my cry come near before thee, O, o Lord. Give me understanding according to thy word. Give me that hope and that peace because I cast it before you. Let my supplication come before you. That supplication, oh my goodness. Supplication is, is what I call petitioning on steroids. It's, it, it's when I'm laying it before God in such a way. Let my supplication come before the deliver me. Not according to my word. And y'all, this will mess you up now. Deliver me according to thy word, not my wishes. Mm. Thy word. My lips shall utter praise. When thou hast taught me thy statutes. You know, we ought to praise God for just revelation. We ought to praise God for him just taking the time to teach us. Just as, as a teacher would, would teach a student. It, it, let me say it like this. As a teacher would take the time with a struggling student. How patient that teacher is. My lips shall utter praise when thou hast taught me thy statutes. God, when you taught me things I could, I never would have understood without you teaching them to me. I'll praise you for it. My tongue shall speak of thy word for all thy commandments are righteousness. See, I don't have no problem with speaking the word of the Lord because it's right. Problem is folk don't want to speak the word of the Lord because, because to them, it Jesus said, I came to set a rock of offense. It offends me. If, you know, I tell people, but well, that's offensive. Well, that offends me. You offended because the word's still right and true. You go be offended. The word's still going to be right and true. And at some point, you're going to have to accept it with your offended self. Let thine hand help me, for I have chosen thy priest. God, I've chosen your way of doing things. I'm making this petition. Let your hand help. Help me in it because I've chosen your way. Verse 174, I've longed for thy salvation, O Lord, and thy law is my delight. Let my soul live, and it shall praise. Let thy judgments help me. You know, 175 is so important because what it says very simply is, Lord, let my soul live. Let me just continue to live this life that you've, that you've bestowed upon me. And my heart, my soul, the thing within me that's all eternity, as, as you allowed it to live, Lord, I, I, I shall praise you. Let everything to have breath praise the Lord. But I praise you, God, because you let me live. And it shall praise thee. Let thy judgments help me. Let your word help me in this life that you've allowed me to live that I praise you for. Amen. Everybody always got something. If you are alive, you got something to praise God for. And finally, Psalm 119, verse 176. I've gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek thy servant. For I do not forget thy commandments. You know, this is beautiful because we like sheep. All of us at some point have gone astray. All right? I've gone astray like a lost sheep. Some is one sugarcoating it, one trying to stand self-righteous, one being sanctimonious like the Sadducees and Pharisees. I've gone astray like lost sheep. Seek thy servant. But you know why? Because he's the good ship. He said he'll leave 99. To go get the one that's lost because that one that lost was his. Seek thy servant. Here's the thing. And anybody who can say, can be honest within a place that maybe you don't want nobody to know but you and God, when you've gone astray, he'll remind you of his commandments. And his commandments. His commandments will make you want to come home. You, you know, the beauty of the, of the account of the prodigal son was that he knew that he could arise and go to his father's house. He knew he could. And I'm just telling you, the word of the Lord, it'll keep you if you want to be kept, it'll pull you back because it is embedded. It's a thing that he won't allow to leave because he does desire you to come. Amen.
Amen. All right. So I had a question that came in. Good. I'm doing good on time. All right. So here's a question. I'm going to put this up because I got a long answer on this a little bit. Anyway. But then I'm going to go to the word. Now, let me say this. If you don't like truth and you don't like the word of the Lord, you ain't going to like this. Okay. Um, but whatever, that's, that's, you're going to be, you, you and your offended self just going to be offended and the word going to still be true. How do we as Christians handle a family member or members who I, who, uh, who is identifying as transgender and is requesting you be accepting of their choice, not your choice, their choice. How do I handle family gatherings, events, acceptance in my Christian home? Now, let me say this real quick before I even get into this. Uh, it's a whole lot of stuff. A lot of people, you know, it's funny to me that people um, are very protective of their homes as they should be. And so you don't let certain things come in, but it just needs to be evident that this is a Christian home. So here's my, here's my answer. And then I'm going to go to the word on this. answer. Their choice is their choice. But as a Christian, I have chosen to love and honor God above all others. And here's the real problem. Many people have chosen to love and honor people and their feelings above God. And that's where the, that's really where the problem is. Show God's love without compromising your love for or relationship with God. I'm going to deal with this in just a minute because I'm going to leave this up for a little bit. God created them in the gender he desired and treating them according to how God created them is honoring God, even if they feel it's disrespectful to their choice. Conversely, to treat and honor them according to their choice is disrespectful to God as creator. Making it clear where you stand based on God's truth is respectful to all involved. If you tell somebody, look, I understand you call yourself identifying as a woman, even though God made you a, a born biological man, please understand that I'm going to honor God and I'm going to refer to you as such. You don't get to tell me what to call you. I mean, you could tell me that don't mean I got to do it. You ain't God. All right, let me keep going. Never mistreat anyone, especially God. Because a lot of people mistreat God to play nice with a, hurt, a human, a sinful human being and their feelings. So what y'all going to do when they come back and say, you know what? I was wrong all along. I am who God says I am. I, I am who God created me to be. I am a born biological male. I'm no longer trying to, trying to, to, to identify as a female. But here you are, a Christian, and you've been calling them by their female, by their female pronouns. Right. See, you always got to ask yourself the question, what happens if this person ever comes to Christ? Who will I be to them then? Hmm. I'm about to think about that. Family gatherings, events, etc., are to be attended based on God's word and truth, spoken and displayed in God's love and truth. Let me say this. I, 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 this is the best way I can put this. You have to understand who you are in the body of Christ. I understand and I get it as far as family members. Um, and people don't, you know, listen, if there's a lot of crazy activity going on, I don't care. I don't care if we do share a bloodline. You ain't going to see me over there. <laughs> Y'all know good and well, whether you're in the kingdom or you're in the world, a lot of times you ask at a family gathering, who's going to be there? Because you need to get your mind right. You need to get some things. Listen, we can come together as family. We can do whatever we need to do as family. But, but, but it needs to be clear where I stand. I'm not calling someone that God made a male. I'm not calling you sh um, she, her. I'm not calling you whatever you I'm not doing that because I'm not, you're asking me to disrespect my God for your feelings. You know what's so funny to me about this? Chris is the only one asked to do this because they would never ask a Muslim to do it, never ask a Buddhist to do it. You never ask... Uh, Christian is the only one. And see, and, and the first thing they say was, as a Christian, you're supposed to be loving. I'm supposed to be loving God first. Plus, along the fact, here's what I need for us to understand. The transgender piece. Okay, let me say this like this. The homosexual piece, as far as just sexual activity, that's just preference. 
how you get down is how you choosing to get down. I, if this offends anybody, I told you going to be. It is what it is. Listen, that's a choice. If it's not a choice, a crime and a violation is going on. Okay. So here's the thing I need for us to understand too. The transgender piece, though, is a mental health issue. That's a mental health issue. And it's very simple to this. I'm going to go back to this because, again, Google has done a lot to try to take away the, and they have taken away the original story. But at least I found some information. Dr. Paul McHugh, John Hopkins Hospital, Chief of Psychiatry from 1975 to 2001. That's 26 years that Johns Hopkins, Chief of Psychiatry, still believes that being transgender, and he got, fought, he got basically, they let go of him because he took this stance. Still believes that being transgender is largely, largely a psychological problem, not a biological phenomenon. At, um, and with the title of University Distinguished Service Professor at Johns Hopkins Medicine, he continues to wield enormous influence in certain circles when quoted frequently on gender issues in conservative media. He says very simply this, I'm not against transgender people. He said recently, stressing that he is anxious, they get the help they need. But such help should be psychiatric rather than surgical, he maintains. So you have to realize, and see, this the reason why this is this way is because it's a simple elementary truth. If I, as a born biological male, think I am a female, that means there is a there is a mental psychological disconnect. If I thought I was Superman, there's a mental psychological disconnect because I think that I am something that I am clearly not that in the real physical realm mentally i'm thinking i'm something different than what i truly am in a physical state a physical biological state but all of these schools that are trying to go along with that what y'all teaching in biology then okay now so if i have a family member what well, now see it's easier for me because they know i'm a pastor Right. Or, well, let me say it like this. They know I'm a pastor and this is my stance. I ain't going to say it because some pastors will tell them what they want to hear. Right. And, and again, no support in the word. God's word is settled forever. Oh, Lord, that word is settled in heaven. And I'm going to show you some scripture in regards to this. But the first thing people try to tell you is, well, you need to be loving. I don't disagree with that. I need to be loving on God first, then loving on them second. But I need to not compromise the truth in my love. I need to not mistreat them. I'm not going to mistreat you. I'm just not going to do what you want me to do. And I'm not going to do what you tell me to do over and above what God has instructed me to do. That's where the rub is. That's where the rub is. Okay. Put some word on it. <laughs> Let me do that. Genesis 127. For God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. I am tired of politicians, many who, uh, many African-Americans have voted for, telling me they don't know what a woman is. <laughs> I heard a preacher today say, a woman is, you know what a woman is? It's your mom. How you don't know what a woman is? We celebrate Kamala Harris as the first female vice president. And she is at times, says she, you know, she's danced around as to whether she knows what a woman is. Then why are we celebrating you as that? People try to avoid this. I've watched Supreme Court justices do the same thing. How you don't know what a woman is? Go look in the mirror. God knows what a woman is. When you stand before God, God's going to judge you by how he made you. And what he desired, not what you say you are, not how you feel, but how you were fixed, how you were made. Okay, let me put some more word on this. Let me say this too, because this is what they're asking you to do when they're asking you to call you by their pronouns, when you know good, good and well, biologically, what they are. They're asking you to lie to them. I love you too much to do that. Colossians 3, 9 through 10 says, do not lie to one another. Oh, I know. Yeah, but I go by. No, I'm going to call you by what you are, not by what you go by. That is loving because it's true. 
Do not lie to one another since you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man who is renewed in the knowledge according to the image of him who created him. I cannot lie to you and tell you that you're something that you're not. Can't do it. Won't do it. Here's my thing. If you're asking me to do that, what else you asking me to do that's against scripture? If somebody, it, it, listen, that same person came up to you and said, hey, listen, let's go rob this bank. Let's go kill this person. Let's go do this and do that and do this. You'll be like, no, I'm not doing that. Why? Because that God wouldn't be pleased. But then when somebody comes and says, oh, I identify us and here are my pronouns and I'm going to ask you. And see, this is this is the trick of the enemy. I'm going to ask you respectfully that you would call me by that. You can ask me any kind of way you want to ask me, but I'm going to and then I'm going to ask you righteously to accept my righteous answer. Somebody said, help him, Lord, but he preaching and he teaching. It don't mean I don't love you. It, I just love you enough to tell you the truth. It don't mean that I'm not being loving to you, but I just love God more than I love you. If that offends you, I'm sorry. That's just the truth. Because you're not. I don't stand before you on judgment day. I will stand before him, though. And I don't want him to say that you denied me in this issue. Uh, question, would not would not telling them the truth and agreeing with them mean that their blood would be on your hands if they die in that sin? Now, oh my goodness. Let me read this question again. This is a very good question. Um, would not telling them uh, and, and agreeing with them mean that their blood be on my hands in this, uh, in the, in that sin? Now, for me, as a pastor, as a prophet of God, Absolutely. As a believer, I'm going to say, I believe so. And here's the reason why. Because if you're if you're co-signing to, matter of fact, it is, because I'm going to show it to you in scripture in just a minute. It is a sin still, but it is more so for me as a pastor, because of the fact that even throughout Ezekiel, God says, if I don't warn the people and they die in that sin, that sin is on me. But if I warn them and they keep on going, that's on them. This is another reason why I tell y'all, Randall got enough issue. Randall got enough Randall issues that he got to deal with on Judgment Day. I ain't got time to be taking stuff that I know I can handle, like telling you the truth on something like this. I'm sorry, I'm not gonna drag that one before me, right? Okay, I'll put it this way. I'm gonna keep going. Listen, I might be speeding, and I got to deal with speed before I get to the judge. But I ain't gonna. I'm not gonna deal with speeding and not having a seatbelt on. I can control the speed. You know, I know sometimes my foot just might, you know, it might get a little heavy and I have to deal with that. I got to deal with that. Okay, I got a lead foot. I get that. But man, I can put my seatbelt on. I shouldn't have to deal with seatbelt and speeding. <laughs> yes, we shouldn't co-sign on that. Let, I'm, I'm going to give you some scripture on that in just a minute. Matter of fact, let me, here's the thing about this. Um, and I'm gonna skip around on some of my scriptures because I had I had a bunch of them, but I want to make sure. Here's the word it says this in Ephesians four. Uh, it says that we should no longer be children, tossed to and fro. See, when we when we when we are mature Christians, we ought to act like that. We should no longer be children, tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head in Christ. Listen, there's stuff, and I'm a living witness of this, the enemy will try you with stuff when you're a babe in Christ and you're growing in Christ, that he wouldn't try as you grow. But as you grow, you have to know, I do have a responsibility. I'm not co-signing this, right? And many of you have heard me, obviously with this scripture on love, when everybody wants to talk about love. But this one is so true. Love suffers, and I always get this, but everybody leave out verse six. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. Love is not puffed up. Does not behave rudely. That means I ain't got to mistreat you. But see, you don't get to define rude as me not giving you what you want. Or I ask you respectfully. I ask you righteously. 
right? I'm not being rude by telling you the truth. Does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks, does, um, thinks no evil. Verse six is important. And this is why the responsibility is on us, whether we are a preacher or not. It's the greater responsibility is on me. I'll be the first to say that. Does it love does not what? Because it's talking about love in the context. That's why I put them together. Love does not rejoice in iniquity. So why am I celebrating you and your sin? If I love you. Now, if I hate you, and this is what I've said to the gay community, I love you more than a lot of folk who co-sign in you because I love you enough to tell you the truth because I won't rejoice in your sin and your iniquity. I say this, let me say this too, um, but rejoice in the truth. When I preached the message, and, and you know what I said, I fell short, I'm going to come back on this again. The Lord hadn't revealed it to me again. This talks about us growing up. Even when I talk about pride is a sin that hates God, right? Um, and that God hates. Pride is a sin that God hates and that hates God. Even as, even as people who are heterosexual, there are a lot of men who take pride in their conquest. I'm going to put it like that. That's still a pride. That's still pride in the sin, right? So it, it's all of that. So we can't rejoice, even when even when amongst the boys, we can't rejoice in iniquity, right? Do not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoice in the truth. So if you come tell me, I now identify as... I'm not rejoicing with you because that will be rejoicing in sin. It's a sin against God for the way God desired and created you. If you tell me you homosexual, you don't come out gay. I'm not rejoicing with you. I'm not attending a gay wedding. And let me deal with this too in a minute because it just came because it came up again because I was asked this question in regards to something else. Well, tied to the same issue. All right. So I'm not I'm not coming to a gay wedding because because first of all, it's not a wedding. There needs to be a bride and a groom. But that's a whole another issue. So I was asked a question. When uh, a, uh, a a pastor, bishop, whatever, um, uh, William Murphy did the baby dedication for the brat and who's a rapper for those that don't know. And uh, the woman that she says she married to, which y'all, that ain't no marriage. It ain't. It, it is what it is. Whatever. They did a baby dedication for a baby that they obviously somebody had to adopt. Right. Because it wasn't done biologically. Yeah, again, I'm speaking truth. If you don't like that, you, you ain't, I ain't speaking Bible, I'm speaking biology. So I was asked the question, would I personally have done a baby dedication in that situation? What I said was, dedicating a baby is not sinful. However, I would have had a long dialogue with them because there's a piece in that dedication that talks about raising them in the nurtured admonition of the Lord, raising them in the ways of God, the church, and the Holy Bible. And the Holy Scripture. Will you raise and teach them the Holy Scriptures are righteous and the word of God? Which means then I have to ask them a direct question. Are you going to teach them that homosexuality is a sin? That's why I don't think that they would ask me to do it. I've had, let me even go further. Does not rejoice in iniquity. Oh, listen, it rejoices in the truth. Dedicating a baby back to the Lord is not a sin. The sin becomes when I ask you the question, are you going to tell me the truth that, and that you're going to come against the very lifestyle you're living and bringing forth this baby in? I've had preachers, folks whom I love dearly, pastors who will not do a baby dedication for somebody who is single. Or they'll do it for them. They won't do it at a, in Sunday morning service. They'll do it during the week. Or Sunday or in their office, they won't do it before the church because they said that they didn't do it right. Let me tell you something. See, now you're making fornication the issue, not the baby dedication the issue. I don't have no problem with dedicating a baby for a single mom because I'm going to ask her the same question I would have asked a lesbian couple. Are you going to raise them in the same way and let them know? Because see, perhaps that single mom would say, listen, the fact that I'm standing here single, dedicating my child back to, I understand I have to deal with this because of the fornication issue, which was sin, and I would tell them, don't put yourself in this situation. So now we got this clear. Because again, dedicating a baby is not sinful. So I can rejoice in that because that is a truth. Rejoice in something that's iniquity. All right, I'm, I know I didn't got off on that, but I just wanted to address that tonight. Mm -hmm. Now, let me put some more scripture on this. Just a little bit. Here's the thing I need for us to understand. Now I said this. The top two commands is to love God with everything you have, love your neighbors yourself. 
people have put number two as one and put number one as whatever. Number one is still love God with everything I have. That's why I'm not going to do, I'm not going to disrespect my God for your feelings. If you got a problem with that, that's going to be your problem, not mine. Bible says this and how we deal with people. Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Ye therefore be wise as serpents, therefore wise as serpents and harmless as dove. Real simple. All right. Then Peter and other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. That's why I obey. Right. Romans 12, 18. Y'all got to let me give you the scripture. As far as it is possible, if it is possible, as far as it uh, depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Listen, I can go to the family gathering. I can show love to everybody. I can represent Christ. I ain't got to get into it. But if y'all bring it to the table now, see, this is what I would say to people oftentimes. If you ask me the question, you don't get to dictate how I answer. If you put me in that, if you put me in that situation, you don't get to dictate how I respond. I'm going to respond righteously and I'm going to respond with the truth. As long as God likes it, I'm good. If you don't like it, that's a you issue, not a Randall issue. All right. <laughs> Titus 1 and 9. He must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught so that he can encourage others. How? By sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. That's not sound doctrine to go through that foolishness like that. Listen, let me, I got a couple more scriptures. Y'all stay with me. Proverbs 27 and 5. These out of order. I was going a different way, but I just had to do it. An open rebuke is better than secret love. It is better for me to say, babe, I love you, but I ain't going to say nothing about it. An open rebuke is better than secret love. Okay. Okay. Just saying. Amen. Amen. It's settled. Amen. It's settled in heaven. Uh, first Peter. Uh, and this is again how we respond. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. That means then that's who's number one. That that's who the one I I desire to love first and foremost. And please, first and foremost, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. I ain't got to disrespect you. I ain't got to mistreat you. I just ain't gonna tell you what you want to hear. Again, I'm gonna tell you what the truth is from the Word of God. Now, this may, I may not end on this one. Oh, well, let me because yeah, there is one I want to end on. So I'm, let me go. Here, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, chapter 2, verse 14. The natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. This really is not one. Really, this scripture might be even be out of place because let me tell you something. Everybody know biology. Just stop it. These, you know, now they ain't people act like that. Come on now. We know better than that. A born biological man walks into a hospital and tells them that he wants a he wants a pregnancy test. Or that, the, or that he's ovulating, or that he's he needs a menstrual exam, they will laugh him out of that hospital because they know none of those things are possible for you because you are a born biological male. Stop. Okay. Now, let me give you two more scriptures. because This this will, this will finish me off here. For the wrath of God, this is what's going on. I'm going to give you New Testament first, then I'm going to go back to Old Testament. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. So y'all, so we wonder what's going on in the world now. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth. And that's what's going on. Nobody want to hear the truth no more. Suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them for God has shown it to them. For since creation of the world, his individual attributes clearly seen, are clearly seen being understood um, by things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so they are without excuse. God said, listen, ain't no reason for excuse to not know I am who I am and that I'm releasing this. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were, nor were thankful, but became, but became futile in their thoughts and their foolish hearts were dark. I'm just telling you, this, this sounds like 2024. 
professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things, stars, celebrities, entertainers, um, celebrity pastors, all this other kind of stuff. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness. God said, okay, that's what you want. I gave you what you wanted now. I gave you what you wanted. That's why you're getting what you get. I heard a saying the other day, y'all know y'all gonna hear from me eventually. You play sinful games, you're gonna win sinful prizes. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness. In the, and here it is, because it's, it's a sexual thing too. He even addresses this in their lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves. It's dishonorable to call yourself something that God, other than what God made you, who exchanged the truth of God for a lie. That's exchange. I'm a born biological male. I'm exchanging the truth of God for a lie to proclaim that, that, that I'm, I'm transitioning to be a woman. That transition ain't going to ever be made. Anyway, who exchanged the truth of God for a lie and the worship and serve the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions for even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. This is talking about homosexuality. Likewise, also the men leaving the natural use of the woman burn in their lust for one another, men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. That's why both of those verses in 26 and 27 are dealing with this. Because it's not natural, according to the word of God. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased or reprobate mind to do those things which are not fit. Being filled with all unrighteousness, and it goes even beyond the section now, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness, they are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undeserving, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful. That sounds like cancel culture, don't it? Who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death. Not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice. All I'm saying is, yeah, you may not be doing it, but we ought not be approving of those who practice it. And then this is my last scripture. I'm done with this question for tonight. And like I said, uh, you can email me, you can call me, whatever. You be mad, folk be mad, whatever. Don't matter to me. Watch it on YouTube. You mad, you upset. Okay. Who you mad at? What you mad at? Because at some point, we're going to come back to the word of God. That's why I put the word on this. So if you're realistically, you need to take this up with God. You don't need to take this up with me, but you can take it up with me. It's fine. I'm not God, but 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 I'm going to give you God's word. Isaiah 5 and 20. God said this long ago. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet. And sweet for bit. Ain't nothing wrong with what they doing. Let them folk live their life. Somebody got to love you to tell you the truth. You know, you know, the old mothers would tell you, say, baby, now you got, you got to do better than you've been doing. And you know what? You knew exactly what they meant. You knew exactly what they meant because you knew what you were doing was wrong. And they telling you, you got to do better than that. The church ought to be the one place of holiness where we have to say to the world, to people, all to ourselves, right is right because God says it's right. Sin is sin because God says it's sin. And we have to call evil, evil and good, good and not, not switch it around. We have to call darkness, darkness and light, light. Bitter, bitter, sweet, sweet. Call it what God says it is. Call it what God designed it to be. Call it what God desires for it to be. Period. Call it for what God created it to be. 
End of story. I hope at least that answers that question, that comment. But again, I'm not going to shy away from things that are the truth of God and his word. It's just that simple. And so, again, I was asked. So, nevertheless, Lord willing, I'll see you all. We got virtual only service this Sunday. Uh, Resurrection Sunday will be in person, March 31st. The double tree at 10 o'clock. I pray if you look there, we'll see you. And Lord willing, I'll be back here. Bible study, probably with another question or two uh, next week, or we'll deal with some things from Holy Week next week. And then after that, I'm going to deal with some things again uh, from an apologetic standpoint, because I want us to be ready to always give an answer uh, and do that with gentleness and respect. Amen. Amen. Let us close out now in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We bless and praise your holy name. We thank you, God, for the completion of Psalm 119, a beautiful psalm just about your word. Lord, we pray that your word became a greater priority, a greater love of ours, just through going through Psalm 119, Lord. And help us, God, to be settled, that your word is forever settled in heaven. Lord, we thank you. We bless your holy name. Lord, hide, hide your word in our heart that we may not sin against you. Lord, help us to delight, to love your word, and to rejoice in your word more than one who finds grace for Lord, have mercy upon us and Lord, help us that as we go out and as we even have to deal with those who are close to us, those who we may even share a bloodline with at events, at gatherings, wherever it may be, may we always be light. May we not sign up to call evil good and good evil. Lord, help us to call good good and evil evil. Help us, Lord, to not condone God and not, not co-sign on sin, God, but with compassion to convey the truth in love. Lord, have mercy upon us and help us to never compromise your holy word. Lord, bless us, keep us, and strengthen us as your people. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen.